Hey, what's going on guys? I'm Nick Gray from Fandroid, and this here is the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you right from the beginning. When I first used this phone at the launch event last month in San Francisco, I was pretty disappointed. Yes, it does have 12 gigabytes of RAM, which is more than you'll ever need, a Snapdragon 865 processor that's extremely powerful, and an amazing display. But even when you add up all those things, it still costs $1,200, which makes all of the hardware seem pretty underwhelming, especially when you consider that this isn't the best that Samsung has to offer. If you want that, you're gonna have to shell out an additional $200 for the Galaxy S20 Ultra. So with the price and all the specs that this one has to offer, why would anybody really want to buy that? Well, let's find out. This is my review of the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus. To start things off, I'd like to remind you that the Galaxy S20, the 20 Plus, and the S20 Plus Ultra are pretty much the same device, with really only the cameras, the display sizes, and their batteries really setting them apart from each other. Of the three, the Galaxy S20 and the 20 Plus are the most similar, with really only the depth sensor being missing from the back of the Galaxy S20, which is honestly inconsequential. All three phones are powered by a Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 processor, which is extremely powerful, but that also means you get 5G connectivity built right in. But the main difference here and the biggest upgrade from last year's Galaxy S10 lineup is the fact that these phones all come with 12 gigabytes of RAM, which if you think about it, is more RAM than what you get on the average PC these days. Now, we all know that simply adding more RAM to a smartphone doesn't always improve performance, but the RAM management that Samsung's worked out for the Galaxy S20 Plus is absolutely phenomenal. You can literally open at least two dozen apps and have them running in the background and then jump back into them whenever you want without any of them having to reload. You could definitely argue that 12 gigabytes of RAM is a bit of overkill considering that you have to pay a big premium for that just so that you can save a couple seconds throughout the day. But honestly, the experience that this offers is absolutely phenomenal. The only area that Samsung's really skimped out just a little bit is in the storage. You get 128 gigabytes of storage in here, but you should be getting 256 if you're gonna be paying $1,200 for a smartphone. The silver lining though is you still get a micro SD card slot right up here, which means you can expand the storage on your own if you still have a micro SD card that you've been using. As is the case every year, Samsung is among the first to deliver a phone running the latest chipset from Qualcomm. This time around, it's the Snapdragon 865. And as you'd expect, it's fast and more power efficient than the last variant. But while this phone is incredibly fast, you'll still have a hard time feeling the difference between this phone and last year's Galaxy S10 Plus, unless you have the two devices side by side. The real advantage here though, is that every phone running a Snapdragon 865 chipset also comes with 5G. We all know that 5G is the future, but outside of a few major cities within the United States, we're still not seeing any of the speed improvements that major US carriers have promised with millimeter wave and low band deployments. That being said, all the major carriers in the US and across the globe are deploying 5G as fast as they can. So your Galaxy S20 Plus will be ready to go as soon as it's available in your area. One issue with the hardware that I'd like to point out is Samsung's choice to use Qualcomm's ultrasonic fingerprint sensor. Well, in display optical fingerprint sensors have gotten a lot faster, larger, and more reliable over the last year and a half, Qualcomm's tech has pretty much stayed the same. I complained about how slow this was on last year's Galaxy S20 Plus, and it doesn't look to have gotten any better on the new device. It only seems to work about 80% of the time, which honestly, in this day and age, is unacceptable. For me, the most disappointing aspect of these two phones comes down to their design and color options. If you're a case user, you can completely disregard this complaint. But that being said, I think Samsung really just phoned it in this time around, especially when you look at their last flagship smartphone, which was the Galaxy Note 10 and its iconic Aura Glow finish. By contrast, the Galaxy S20 lineup is pretty dull and uninspiring. But at least this new design comes with a silver lining. Usually my number one complaint with Samsung phones always comes down to the curved display. Despite what you may have heard, Samsung didn't do away with it completely. It's still there, but it's barely noticeable, leading to a lot fewer accidental touches with the side of your hand and a lot less glare along the top and bottom of the screen when you're watching video in landscape. If you're using an older Samsung phone, it may actually be worth upgrading just for this. 
Okay, so I may be kidding on that front, but the display is still one of the main reasons why you would actually want to upgrade to this phone, and that comes down to its 120 hertz refresh rate, making this one of the best displays I've ever used in a smartphone. By default, the 6.7 inch display's Quad HD Plus resolution only delivers a 60 hertz refresh rate, but you can bump that up to 120 hertz if you're willing to change the resolution to full HD Plus. No matter what people tell you, there is a noticeable difference in clarity between the two settings. But with the higher refresh rate enabled, the phone feels so much smoother. Personally, I made the switch after three days with the phone and haven't looked back yet. It will cost you a little bit on the battery side though, but from what I can tell, it really doesn't make a huge difference. For as much praise as the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra has gotten for its 108 megapixel sensor and 100x hybrid zoom, the cameras on the Galaxy S20 Ultra may actually be better. And this comes down to its hardware and software actually working as advertised. The main camera setup on the back of this phone features four sensors paired with a standard ultra wide and 3x telephoto sensor and then a time of flight sensor thrown in there for additional depth sensing information for AR effects. The front facing camera only has a single sensor compared to last year's Galaxy S10 Plus but it still captures great images nonetheless. If you're upgrading from an older Samsung phone, you'll definitely notice the improvements. Images are extremely crisp, low light performance is spectacular, especially when you're using the night mode feature, and you also get 8K video capture. If you're upgrading from an older Samsung phone, you'll definitely notice the improvements here. Images are extremely crisp and low light performance is spectacular, especially when using the low light mode. And then you also get 8K video capture. Now that last one may seem like a little bit of an overkill since 8K TVs are still extremely expensive, but at least you can future-proof your videos starting now. The only downside is that Samsung still does a little bit too much of post-processing on its images, over smoothing people's faces to get rid of imperfections and overcompensating a little bit too much on HDR photos. The first issue can be toned down just a little bit in the settings, but the only way to remove Samsung's beauty mode completely is by switching to manual mode in the camera app, which is a little bit disappointing. On the software side, all three of these phones are running on Samsung's One UI on top of Android 10. Now, while Samsung's interface is a lot better than most other third-party skins that are out there, it's still a little bit bloated and a little bit too heavy when compared to stock Android. Case in point, if you want to find out about the phone's battery status or tweak its settings, you need to know that it's hidden inside the device care subsection, which definitely isn't the most obvious place to put it. And then there's Bixby. Now I get that Samsung has hundreds of millions of smartphones out there, and if only 5% of them use the service, it makes financial sense to keep it running. But it's a horrible service when compared to the Google Assistant, and the Bixby daily screen to the left of the main home screen takes two seconds to load each time you accidentally just swipe over to it. My recommendation is to turn it off completely, or better yet, just install a third-party launcher from the Play Store. One thing that I really enjoy about the Galaxy S20 Plus is its 4,500 milliamp hour battery, which is a little bit more than 10% larger than the S20's 4,000 milliamp hour cell. It's not quite enough to make this a two day phone, but you'll have a really hard time killing this off in a single day, unless you're willing to play Call of Duty Mobile seven hours straight. And the large battery also makes Samsung's reverse wireless charging feature finally useful, since you should typically have quite a bit of extra power to spare to charge up your friend's smartphone. And when you do finally run out of power, topping the phone off takes a little bit over an hour thanks to the phone's 25 watt fast charger, or a little bit over two if you're doing it wirelessly. Overall, the Samsung Galaxy S20 Plus is an amazing device, just as long as you're willing to get over that $1,200 price point. Now, personally, if I had to choose between this phone here and the Galaxy S20, I would choose the latter. Simply put, I don't think that added half inch of screen real estate and 12% bump in battery capacity are really worth $200. But if you're willing to get over that $1,200 price point, this phone here, the Galaxy S20 Plus, is probably one of the best smartphones that Samsung's built in a very, very long time. Just remember to keep an extra $30 on hand to buy a case to cover it up.